Welcome to Between Two Perns. My name is Robert Jackson Dickert, and I'm joined here by Mary Robinette Kowal. Hello, good to see you. She is an award-winning, best-selling author. Uh, she's also an award-winning puppeteer, and she's the only person to have ever been impeached from their position as president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. How's it going today? Good. The impeachment was really good for me. Yeah. I just needed a lot more time with writing, so I kind of encouraged them to lean into that. So your first name is Mary. Robinette. But you go by Mary Robinette, right? Mm-hmm. In the tradition of Southern double names. Correct. His name is Ricky. Ricky Bobby. Ricky Bobby. He's got two first names. You've won a staggering number of awards for your books as well. And I can't help but draw the parallel between yourself and world famous NASCAR driver Ricky Bobby, who also has two first names and like yourself is amongst the best in his field. Well, Dick, here's the deal. I'm the best there is, plain and simple. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence. Do you think the two of you might be more alike than you are different? Uh, probably. I mean, we both have the ROB in there, which is, I think, again, really key to, to successful uh, portrayal of anything in, in whatever field you're in. You know, you, you look at Robert Jordan. If you don't have that ROB in there, how are you even succeeding as a writer? I don't, I don't understand. So you think, you think with my first name being Robert, I have... You have potential, yeah. Okay, excellent. This is probably why this is such a good program. Stop it, Mary Robinette. Okay, I will. <laughs> when it comes to competition, do you think that only the winner matters? Or to put it another way, do you think that if you aren't first then you might as well be last. Um, yes. If you ain't first, you're last. You know, you know what I'm talking about? That phrase, the trademark, not to be used outside the tradition of Ricky Bobby. And also, if you are first, you might as well be last. How does that work? Because when you are looking at awards, um, every award that is given when, for, through a nomination process, the person who won was somebody's favorite and the person who lost was also somebody's favorite. Okay. And the person who won was somebody's least favorite. So awards are, are meaningless. They're useful in terms of uh, visibility, um, and visibility can translate to sales. They're useful for external validation, if that's one of the things that drive you. But, um, but in terms of actually evaluating the quality of something, they are not useful. Many female authors use initials instead of their name to avoid the implicit social societal bias that many people have for reading men instead of women. But you double down and you put not just one, but two traditionally female names on your covers. Do you think that you would sell more books if you took the initials route since your covers would read Mr. Kowal and readers would assume you were a man? Um, I would probably sell more that way, and I did think about it, and I was, uh, I was tired of that paradigm. So, yeah, doubled down, doubled down hard. Speaking of men, your latest book is called The Spare Man. Mm -hmm. Every chapter starts with a cocktail recipe. Yes. There's 38 chapters. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the way you meant for the book to be experienced was by making the cocktail at the beginning of each chapter. I was wondering how many chapters of The Spare Man are safe to read as you, the author, intended in one sitting? Uh, two, unless uh, you are doing one of the uh, non-alcoholic uh, chapters, in which case you can consume three. I was also wondering if this is sort of like a new hack for authors that you've discovered. Maybe if you get your readers drunk enough, they don't notice how good or bad the book is and they just know they had a great time reading it, instant five stars on Goodreads. The actual problem that I, I discovered was that because my readers are reading responsibly, it took them forever to finish the book. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. So it, it actually works against you in, in many ways. I kind of followed this train of thought um, and thought I would take it one step further because that's really what I'm good at. Right. What if we started infusing the pages with cocaine? Hmm. Because then readers would kind of absorb it passively through their skin as they go. They become addicted to reading your books and it would make them impossible to put down because if you tried to stop reading, you would go through withdrawals. 
the the question is whether or not readers would find the reading process sufficient for their absorption or if they would start grinding and snorting the books. That would be problematic. I know I've had a lot of ideas for you and some of them have been a little off the wall. Um, But if you'll indulge me in just one more. Absolutely. So you've got the cocktail recipes Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the chapters. And you have to shake those to get them good and mixed. Some of them you stir. Okay. But what if you also put pastry recipes at the start of each chapter for readers to enjoy as well, and you could call this new concept Shake and Bake? That's a great idea, and I'm going to do that in my next book. Woo! Yeah! Amen! Shake and Bake! Actually, you know what? I think the pastries, pastry recipes, should be at the end of the chapters. Here's why. You reach the end of a chapter, you, you mix things up, but you have to do a bake time, right? Right. So you mix the, the, the pastries, and then you put it in the oven, and then you make a cocktail and read the next chapter, and that chapter is timed so it is perfect for the pastry to come out of the oven. You're a genius. This is why I win the awards. I get 15% though, right? Because of the, the idea. 10 the idea is worth 15 at least. No. Okay, I'll take 10. Okay. Perhaps your most prolific work is Calculating Stars. It's one of only 18 novels to win the Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Award in this single year. Mm-hmm. You think you're better than me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> most writers only win a few awards in their lifetime. But you've won a staggering number, and I wondered if if you had any tips for how to go about winning more awards. Um, So we've already discussed the name situation. Right. Uh, The other thing that I find is that readers respond very well to nostalgia Uh and, and an issue. So if you can think of something nostalgic and then an issue that you can pair it with. So let's say roller skates. People are nostalgic for roller skating. So you have a whole roller skating novel and then you pick an issue. So let's say that the issue you pick is uh, snorting cocaine books. Okay. Right? Because that's a real endemic problem in the United States. That I created. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a roller skater, like the whole thing is roller skates. Like, like you remember Starlight Express? Yeah. Right. Andrew Lloyd Webber, that the, those multiple names also can counteract the lack of an ROB, I think, by the way. Okay. Um, so imagine Starlight Express, but the central character is someone who is struggling with an addiction to cocaine-infused pages. I love that. It would be an award-winning book immediately. Are you going to write that? Maybe. There's just so many books. So it sounds like you could, you could use a co-writer on I something could. like that. I could. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll let you run with that one. Or skate with that one. <laughs> Love that. Thanks. That's excellent, because I'm actually interested in, in trying to win a Hugo mm-hmm. in the future. I look forward to, to voting for this book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you know what you're going to title it? Something with speed. Speed's yeah. got to be in the name. Yeah. Speed reader. Speed reader. Speed skating. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, Starlit speed reader. Coming 2027. <laughs> But when it comes to trying to win a Hugo, um, do you think that the best way to win one is just to refrain from speaking out against China? Um, You know, I tried that this year and it didn't work for me. Uh, While we're on the topic of China, though, Mm -hmm. um, on your website, you mentioned that you didn't really start writing in earnest until your brother and his family moved to China. Correct. Do you think more authors can overcome writer's block by shipping their family off to China? Um, I think any overseas place that you can send your family yeah. is going to help writing okay. significantly. Just anywhere that'll take them. Anywhere that, that'll take them. And if you can't afford to ship them overseas, you might look at investing in a closet, a storage container, um, McDonald's gift certificates, anything that will get them away. Okay. Really. That's excellent advice. And I'm pretty sure that there are some people who are going, yes. <laughs> It makes sense that you have such good advice when it comes to this sort of thing, because you've been giving writers advice on your Patreon and on uh, Writing Excuses, Mm -hmm. the podcast, uh, for quite a while now. Um, What is the best 
writing excuse? My cat. Your cat. How? Is talking to me. Okay. Let's. Do we have time to unpack that or? Well, in in all honesty, my my cat does use buttons to talk. Guppy and I had gone out for her morning potty walk, and then I took her straight to daycare. Guppy gone potty. See you later. Where? Guppy gone daycare. Guppy gone outside friends. Guppy play outside friends. And I made the mistake of putting her button board close to my desk. So... You know, I'm I'm trying to write, and then she's there saying, bored, bored, all done. It's very hard to keep going. It's hard to get that motivation. Yeah, it's called augmentative interspecies communication. Correct. And so you think the cat is talking to you. I do. I do. So the acronym for augmentative interspecies communication is AIC. Mm -hmm. Do you really expect me to believe that you're simply trying to teach your cat to speak and not that the acronym really stands for artificial intelligence cats so that your cat can eventually help you to write novels. Oh, she already is. She's already writing the novels. She's helping. Like with Spare Man, for instance. Okay. Uh, what I did was I was doing a reverse engineer of the outline, as one does, and uh, had laid everything out on note cards and uh, she played tag across them. And when I looked at how it had been rearranged, I was like, actually, that is a better sequence. And uh, that is in the acknowledgments of the book. So uh, just an acknowledgement for helping you crack the whole book? Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't yeah. get a co-author credit on that one? I do feed her and house her. Backtracking a little bit mm -hmm. to writing excuses. Yeah. You were on there with a host of other talented authors, but among their number, of course, was Brandon Sanderson. Mm -hmm. um, you recently co-wrote a novel with him. And uh, it's called The Original. Mm -hmm. What was that process like? Well, Brandon, as you might imagine, is fairly demanding. Sure. Um, so the first thing was that I had to take the private jet. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not the first class jet. It was the second class jet. So there were not actually any seats because he wanted me to be pacing, which is something that he finds very important. So there was a lot of pacing in midair uh, as I was going back and forth to Utah to work on the book. It was really difficult. That's, that sounds... I can't imagine. No, no. It was very hard. Um, he gave me a Bible for the book, for the world. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we had to talk a lot and talking to Brandon, you know, again, torture. It's exhausting. Exhausting. He's, you know, humorless. Right. Um, just like a little dim, a little, the number of times that I had to say, Brandon, this world building just makes no sense. Right. It was significantly more than I expected. It's a good thing. He's got that team yeah. to, to yeah. carry him. Yes. Yes, exactly. That is why he has so many people working for him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm actually, I was curious about this process because I'm co-writing a book with Brandon right now. And this is totally unrelated. I just want to be really clear about that. But like, what is your advice for when you're co-authoring a book with someone and they seem really excited about the idea when you first like set it up and everything, but then ever since they haven't been much help with the outline or the writing or giving any feedback whatsoever on the project? Um, what that says to me is that they have deep, deep trust for you. Okay. And... I should just... Keep just, going. Just run with it. Yeah. Just run with it. Okay. That's actually, that's actually really helpful. Mm -hmm. I've been struggling with this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Th theoretically. Theoretically. No, yeah. Unrelated. Absolutely. <clears throat> you and Sanderson run in the same circles. Uh, so it's, it's no wonder that your works have some similarities to each other. The fourth book of your Glamorous Histories mm -hmm. series, Valor and Vanity, is pitched as if Jane Austen wrote Ocean's Eleven. Yes. Mistborn is often described as My Fair Lady meets Ocean's Eleven. Oh. I have never heard that. But now that you say it, I see it. Makes sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it certainly does. And you, you touched on this earlier when we were 
figuring out the idea for our uh, roller skating cocaine mm -hmm. book. But is the secret to writing good fiction just crossing a beloved classic with Ocean's Eleven? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the secrets. Uh, Spare Man, uh, secretly, also. Also Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, but the key with that is that I flipped the perspective. I'm going to have to go back and reread in an entirely new light now. Yeah, yeah. I keep saying that it's Thin Man in space because I am trying to draw attention from the fact that it's another Ocean's Eleven book, but... Yeah. Wow. Are, th are there any other major works that, that you can think of that are, are kind of like that, that you have the skinny on, that you know? Well, Dragon Riders of Pern is Ocean's Eleven. You are so right. They have to get in. They have to get the thing. They have to get back they have out. They get back out. There's, right, all right. of the complications. There's assembling the, the team. They talk to each other. They talk to each other. The, th the things happen? The things happen. Yeah. There's the twist. There's the moment when the plan looks like it's, you know, they've got a plan and it goes terribly wrong. And then it turns out that that was actually the, the right way for things to go after all. This is mind blowing. The, this industry, uh, the more I, I look into it, the more like vile, but also simple it is. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That may also be what you need to do with your Brandon book too. Do it, you have Ocean's Eleven in there? I don't. But I'm sure I'm sure it's sort of like just naturally found its way in there. But yeah, probably. I, I think I need to layer on the yeah. Ocean's Eleven yeah. side yeah. of things. Yeah. And remember, you can also do Ocean's Eight, Ten, or Thirteen. Oh. Is there not a twelve? There was a twelve. Don't want to do that one. Oh. Oh, that's a good point, actually. That one wasn't great. Mm -mm. It, but you know, it did have. Uh, was it? It wasn't Audrey Hepburn. Who was it? Julia Roberts. It was Julia Roberts playing Julia Roberts. That's right. It had Julia Robertsception in it. That's right. And I, I kind of actually think that that is an aspect of the of Ocean's Twelve that that could be played in more, like Stephen King in the Dark mm -hmm. Tower yeah. series playing yeah. Stephen King. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now you are also a professional, award-winning puppeteer mm -hmm. for many years, and I, I know that interviews can be kind of intimidating sometimes. Um, so I thought it might kind of help relax you. Thank you. If we talked with puppets for the rest of the interview. Sure. Okay, is this clean? Clean enough. It seems fine. Usually I spritz them with vodka, but we'll just roll with it. And I see you took the one with the good focus. Well, it's got two forward eyes because it's a predator. Oh, I see. Yours is, uh, the, yeah. Yours yeah. is the pred. I see how that is. Okay, thanks. Oh my gosh, you were so good at this. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Carry on. You've worked on Sesame Street, but maybe even cooler, you worked on Lazy Town. I did. It's a piece of cake to bake a pretty cake. If the way is hazy, you gotta do the cooking by the book. The guy who played the villain of the show, Stefan Carl Stephenson, mm -hmm. is a legend in the world of memes. What was it like working with him? He was the nicest guy. I, I genuinely loved Stefan Carl. I can't even joke about this. And I wouldn't want you to. Yeah. He, he's a legend. Legend and so talented. Sorry. My, my brain is slipping a little bit. Uh, he, um, I don't know if you got to see this or knew about this, but he also went on the live tour of The Grinch as The Grinch and was born to play the part. That is incredible because... I've never seen an actor who doesn't tr appear to be trying to be like Jim Carrey, but is kind of yeah Iceland version of Jim Carrey. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Did you ever imagine that the work you do by operating puppet hands on Lazy Town would be categorized amongst the greatest pieces of art that you've lended a hand in creating? Um, it seemed apparent every day on Lazy Town that we were enrolled in a work of genius because the creator would let us know that daily. How do you keep going knowing that you've peaked? Well, I, uh, I follow the advice of Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe was asked how he felt knowing that he would never ever be in something as famous as Harry Potter, as big a star as he was during Harry Potter. And he said, well, no one else will either. No one else is ever going to be as good as me. So, you know, 
and I just enjoy everything that comes. Well, if you ain't first, you're last. And Mary Robinette, you're number one.